Oh no. Okay. That's wrong. Okay, did everybody manage to download the slides for today? So we're all in the right room today, and I haven't left you standing for the first 20 minutes, so hopefully we'll be able to cover the material in the first of the aerosols and clouds lecture. So if you remember, we're going to split alternative weeks between the gas processes, so the atmospheric chemistry part of it, and the aerosols and clouds. So this week should be a review and overview of what you should presumably already know to a large degree in aerosols and clouds. So it's going to be a, an, introduction, an introductory primer to aerosol and cloud processes. So do we all know what aerosols are? Tell me what aerosols are. Sorry? Uh, sulfate is an example of an aerosol. But what, what is it? Well, we'll come around to the definition. But if you think about the sorts of things that, you have, that the atmosphere is made up from, it's gases and particles. Okay? So you've got material that's in the gas phase, a material that's either in the liquid phase or a solid phase. Now, first, the first time these were explicitly detected, solid and liquid particles in the atmosphere, was by a guy called John Aitken in the late 1900s. And he discovered them and called them condensation nuclei. We know why he called them condensation nuclei. Well, the reason was that if you put, these, uh, put air into a very high supersaturation, then you could see particles that were optically detectable. So do you know what a supersaturation is? <clears throat> Does anyone know what a supersaturation is? 
<coughs> yep, supersaturation is something that's above saturation. Saturation is 100% saturation ratio. Or, uh, is a saturation ratio of one. That's when the saturation vapor, pre the vapor pressure of something reaches the saturation vapor pressure. So in a supersaturation, if you expose normal air to a supersaturation, you see all these very small particles, and they're called condensation nuclei. And he made a statement <clears throat> that when water vapor condenses, it always does, it always condenses on a solid nucleus. So if there was no dust in the atmosphere, there'd be no clouds, no fog, no mist, no rain. So you can see that particles in the atmosphere are very, very important for a lot of meteorological processes. Is that true? No. It's not true? So do you know anywhere in the atmosphere where there is no dust? Okay, so what supersaturation do you need to be before you condense without any dust? Uh, if you get to about, well, 300 would definitely do it. There are certain cases where you get to a 40% supersaturation. But it's not possible to actually get to those very, very high supersaturations in the atmosphere because there is always some dust. An aerosol, an aerosol is not a particle, okay? Do not mistake the fact, do not confuse the two terms. An aerosol is a collection of particles in the gas. So, in this room, the air is an aerosol, because there are particles in the gas in this room. So, everywhere in the atmosphere, you have an aerosol. Wherever there are particles, you have an aerosol because they're carrying the gas. So what shape and size are aerosol particles? Well, they're not round, or they're not all round, and they can have lots and lots of different morphology. So how, we, how do you define the size of an aerosol particle? If they're not all the same shape? Sorry? The terminal speed. Uh, so how would you measure the terminal speed? So if you had, if you had something that could aerodynamically size it, so you're measuring the, the resistance of the particle to air at a given flow rate, then you could measure the size, the Stokes diameter of the particle. So that's the effective diameter that the particle would be if it were spherical. You can measure it optically, you can measure it by mobility, but there are lots and lots of different measurements of an aerosol size. And so the same particle can be measured to have a different size depending upon how you measure it. All things, if they have the same density and they're all spheres, then you can then the sizes would all be the same. The aerodynamic size, the optical size, and the mobility size would all be the same. However, they're not all the same size, and they're not all the same shape, and they're not all the same density. So we need to be aware that you can have a whole range, particularly of solid particles in the atmosphere, you can see their salt particles on the top left hand side and mineral dust, their combustion particles on the right hand side, their mixed combustion and sulfate particles at the bottom on the right hand side. And so all of these things can act and can exist in a mixed way in the atmosphere. And they can be from both man-made and natural sources. And they're an integral part of the Earth atmosphere system because they're everywhere and you don't ever get anywhere in the atmosphere where there are no particles. So, if the particles 
can act as a droplet for clouds under atmospheric conditions, they can be called a cloud condensation nucleus. So what's the difference between a condensation nucleus and a cloud condensation nucleus? Uh, the, yeah, I mean, if you have a condensation nucleus that you can see at a high supersaturation, if it's big enough, it can also act as a cloud condensation nucleus at supersaturations that you would find in the atmosphere. So do you know what sort of supersaturations you find normally in the atmosphere? They're normally about, they're normally a fraction of 1%, so 0.1%. So 100.1% relative humidity in a cloud is 0.1% supersaturation. 100.05 is 0.05% supersaturation. So if a condensation nucleus can turn into a cloud droplet, at about 0.1% supersaturation, it can be a cloud condensation nucleus. So it's important distinction, and we'll cover this later on in the course when we predict the supersaturation um, that can turn a particle into clouds. So because you can't see most of the particles, because they're sub-visible, and they're only trace amounts. So what sort of trace amounts? Do you know what the sort of amounts of particles are in the atmosphere? So what, how, would you, how would you measure or how would you describe the amount of particles in the, in the atmosphere? Parts per million. Sorry? Parts per million. Parts per million. That's difficult. Would that be parts per million by mass or parts per million by volume? or? That's how you'd normally describe the mixing ratio of gases. It's difficult to describe particles in the same way because they have very different densities and they have different sizes and because they're in a different phase. If you want to describe the mixing ratio of two things that are the same phase, so a gas in a gas, you can do it by a volumetric mixing ratio. If you've got solid and a gas, it's difficult to say you've got 10 parts per million of this solid in this gas because the volumes will be of material of different densities because of the phase. So normally you do it in concentrations. Here's the problem. So, which doesn't depend on the density. If you did it, no, not, not normally. What you would do is you would say the number concentration of particles might be 1,000 particles per cubic centimeter. Okay, that doesn't say anything about the size of the particles or the volume. <coughs> or you can say it is 10 micrograms per cubic metre, and then it is in a mass per unit volume. Normally you don't describe it as a volume per volume, or a mass per mass, which would be a mixing ratio. So it's difficult to actually call it. If an exercise for you, you can tell me next week, what is one part per million, what is the mass per unit volume given one gram per cc density of particles. And tell me next week what one part per million would be in grams per cubic centimeter or grams per meter cubed. And you'll find that it's difficult to actually equate mixing ratio to a concentration. You might be able to tell me in five minutes. Depends. But it is, it's, it's challenging to use mixing ratio for particles. Normally we use concentrations, and these can be number concentrations or mass concentrations. That's normal. 
It's not impossible, but you would have to know what you mean if you talk about mixing ratio. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is just a very brief outline of what we're going to do through the course. We're going to talk about why you might study atmospheric aerosol. We'll talk a little bit about the health effects. We'll talk a little bit about radiative forcing. We'll talk a little bit about how particles speak to the gases. We'll then talk about the nature of particles. So where they're from, what they're made of, what they look like, what their phase is, how many there are, what they're made of, how they're mixed, how they interact with water vapour. We'll talk about where they come from, primary, secondary, so formed by condensation, form aqueous reactions in the particles. We'll talk a little bit about nucleation. Do we know what nucleation is? Well, we will do by the end of this lecture. Coagulation, well, by the end of the course. Coagulation, surface processes, how we turn particles into clouds, something called curler theory, what happens inside a cloud, so the uptake of gases, aqueous reactions, the outgassing of less soluble gases that are made in clouds, how the aerosol is modified by the cloud, and droplet coalescence and precipitation. So, have you done everything? Have you covered everything in all of your courses previously? Yeah? So you know it all? Well, that's brilliant, because if you know it all, this is the other part of the exam, so you get full marks. You'll be able to do the gases, you'll be able to do the particles, and you'll be able to pass the exam very easily. So, this is just going to be a, a very easy course for you. <clears throat> so, the earliest evidence for particles. When people were observing in ancient times the optical effects in the atmosphere from things like volcano eruptions that they caused gloomy cold and stains darkly the atmosphere of our region. And this was a Roman guy in about 2,000 years ago. They're, they're noticing optical properties of aerosol. So the optical properties of the aerosol that were emitted from the volcano are causing the change to the atmosphere. Why are they causing the optical changes to the atmosphere? What do they do? What, what do the aerosol particles do? Uh, so they're not necessarily reflecting it back to space, so much as they are, they are scattering the sunlight. They'll reflect some of it back to space, but if you see it, it's reflecting some of it to your eye as well. Yeah. So it's refracting and scattering the light, and those optical properties are the first indication. Of observe, well, it's the first technique for actually observing aerosol particles. So, does anyone know when the first clean air legislation took place? Twelve seventy-three. Okay. So the earliest legislation was a royal pro proclamation in the UK to stop coal burning in London. Did it work? No, because in 1950 we had the London smogs. So they'd already given legislation 700 years before because they noted that air pollution was caused by coal burning in London. And it was aimed, this legislation was aimed at light industry. So this was the first industrial regulation in the world for air pollution because it was causing problems to the population. And in the 1600s, the UK noticed we were getting polluted by the French. So France was causing long-range pollution to the UK because they were burning seaweeds 
on the beaches in northern France, and the pollution was coming across to the UK. Okay? So the gas oilers, well, in southern France, have complained to the King of England. Sorry, this is where they were talking about the French complaining to the UK, but the UK had already complained to the French because the smoke had been coming across the channel. So this became political. It was a political point that they were arguing about who was causing the most pollution. So is there a modern day precedent where the UK is arguing with Europe? It's been going on for a long time. And thick layers of haze over northern Europe, identified as agricultural peat burning, began in the late 1700s and peaked in the 1850s. So what other times, what other problems were noted in northern Europe about burning from the UK and mid-Europe? Well, the acid rain problem was first identified because of Scandinavian trees being affected by European pollution. But it was noted a couple of hundred years before as well. So these things have been long-standing. Pollution is not a modern problem and particularly particulate pollution from burning and combustion and industrial sources is a very old problem. It's been happening everywhere, but these are just local examples. So even then, questions concerning long-range tra transport were beginning to be asked. So which things are transported the longest in the atmosphere? CFCs. CFCs. So are particles are particles transported further or less distance than gases? If a gas is non-reactive, particles are transported less distance. You're right. Because they can gravitationally settle, they can be lost to diffusion, they can have wet deposition and dry deposition at much faster rates than gases. But if gases are reactive, do you remember we talked last week about OH. If we produce OH here, how, how long does it last? Well, until it gets here, or here, yeah? It lasts seconds. So particles can be transported longer distances than some gases, and less distances than other gases. So which particles are transported most furthest? The smallest ones? Who thinks it's the smallest particles transported furthest? Who thinks it's the largest particles that are transported furthest? Who thinks it's the middle <laughs> size? Has anybody heard of accumulation mode? Accumulation mode accumulates in the atmosphere because it has the longest lifetime. Yeah? The smallest particles are lost from diffusion. The biggest particles are lost from gravitational settling because they're heavy. The ones in the middle <coughs> They accumulate in the atmosphere and they're transported the furthest. Okay? So, Keisling, he studied, did anyone heard of the Krakatoa explosion? Krakatoa is a particular, particularly violent volcanic explosion in Indonesia in 1883. And he was one of the first guys to actually think about the physical explanations. And Kaisling's works, his ideas and his experiments, stimulated a lot of research into fog formation and generation in the atmosphere. And that's about the same time as Aitken came along with his condensation nucleus counter and started being able to explore particles and identify them in the clean and the remote atmosphere. And you can see he got some big papers out of it. And people still cite Aitken's Nature article from 1880. <clears throat> and that's when, after John Aitken had found these particles, aerosols, the term aerosol was coined, and it became at the, the forefront of physical science because nobody could see things smaller than aerosol particles. Has anybody come across Millikan's oil drop experiment? So the, the origins of Brownian motion 
were discovered by the optical detection of the movement of small, very, very fine oil drops from optical detection. Because aerosols were the smallest thing you could see. We didn't have any of the fancy spectroscopy techniques, any of the neutron scattering techniques, any X-ray crystallography. We didn't have those techniques. So aerosols were the smallest things you could see at the beginning of the 20th century. And so they were indicators to a lot of the physics that was developed in the early 20th century. And between the 30s and the 80s, aerosol technology became a big thing. And it was at the end of the 1980s I first started hearing about aerosols. And in the early 90s, there's a lot of researchers that came out in my generation and started developing aerosol science into the modern aerosol science. And one of the key things in the 19, well, 1960s and 70s particularly was the awareness of industrial pollution particularly that was caused because there were lots and lots of dusts caused by different industrial processes. And there was a lot of occupational health problems. And so there was a lot of legislation, there was a lot of aerosol technology trying to quantify and understand the impacts of aerosol particles on human health. <clears throat> so let's go through the legislation and just go backtrack across all the legislative, legislative devices that have been put in place to deal with pollution in general and particulates in particular. So one of the ways, one of the earliest inventions of afterburning and reburning of pollution was forced by the Railway Clauses Consolidated Act. So the emissions from the coal-fired steam engines had to be trapped and fed back into the furnaces to burn their own smoke. Because there was too much smoke coming out of the flues. If you were stood on a railway bridge, it wasn't just steam. Quite a lot of the time, it had a lot of the smoke that was coming out from the furnaces. So they were forced to recycle and regenerate. So you actually get more energy from it as well. So it's, it's quite efficient when you've got reburning. But that was forced by the legislation in 1845. And then they started legislating for factories. 1847 was the first of those pieces of legislation. And then the Alkali Works Regulation Act required that 95% of offensive emissions should be arrested. So the Improvement Clauses Act, the industry were ignoring it. Because you know that if you tell industry to clean something up, if you don't set the targets hard enough, they'll work a way of emitting something different. So in 1863 they thought, ah, hang on, we'll catch these industrialists out and we'll try to close the law down to make the law tighter. So that was probably the first legislation in response to people trying to get around the law. And the Sanitary Act said that enforcers, regulatory enforcers, could close down factories for smoke nuisances. So that gave power to people, to legislators, to actually do something about it. Public Health Act, that was a much broader piece of legislation to help the public rather than just occupational uh, exposure. Smoke abatement, from which legislation to the present day has been based. So all modern legislation has its roots, all the UK legislation, but most countries didn't have any legislation before the UK had legislation. So why did the UK, why was the UK first have legislation? Because the UK was dirtiest. Yeah? So you, you've come to the dirtiest, the, the, the origin of dirt, of, of, of really bad pollution. You've come to one of the cities that was the origin of pollution in the world. Okay? The northwest of England was one of the dirtiest places in the world. But they didn't care about that. They only cared about it in London. Because the London is where all the rich people live. They didn't care about polluting the population that were making most of the pollution because they were just workers. And so most of the legislation was based in London. But eventually, 
the pollution, it was recognised that it was a really, really widespread thing. And the industrialised regions, particularly Manchester and the North West, and um, how many of you guys have been up the M62 towards Leeds and Hull? No? There's a lot of the old towns where the industry, um, it was textile industry, the steel works out towards Sheffield, um, most of the industry was centred around the corridor of the M62 across the north of England. And so all of these places had very, very old factories. And the whole place was really, really dirty. We've cleaned it up a bit now. Most of the factories are closed. So most of the industry has gone away. But not only that, we did a lot of cleaning up. And so the Public Health Act was the first generalised piece of legislation from which all present all present legislation across the world is actually originally uh, is derived. The Works Regulation Act extended and consolidated to pull all of the other acts together. So it's starting to pull the legislation together to make it joined up. And then the Public Health Act, was, which was the broad extended one, was amended and extended the Acts of 1875, 1891, etc. And so we started getting a, a really big body of legislation. Smokeless zone, prior approval legislation. So what did the prior approval legislation do? It meant you had to have permission to build a factory that might cause pollution. So it wasn't just about dealing with present pollution, it was about dealing with future pollution as well. So these things where you had to apply for licenses to build polluting industries. Go back to the London smog because everybody has to talk about the London smog. So this is what happens when you ignore legislation. So they've known about this for a couple of hundred years, but they still carried on burning smoke, uh, burning coal, burning dirty coal, and you end up, because of the meteorological conditions, in a wintertime smog event. And this wintertime smog event, it was only really important because it killed people and people started complaining. Okay? Now, um, look at you with a smog oxygen. Yeah, okay. So, remember last lecture? What was the most damaging component of primary smog? So, the London smog was an example of one of the early primary smogs, not photochemical smog. So, if it's not photochemical, what's the most dangerous stuff? Why did the deaths go up? Sulfuric acid. So where was that? Is it a gas or is it hot? It's attached to the smoke particles. So even though it was a primary pollution event, the smoke which was emitted is a particular, a primary particulate, and mainly soot. It emits sulfur dioxide. Where does the sulfuric acid come from? How is it oxidised? Sorry? Oxy yep. It's normally oxidised by the hydroxyl radical. How do you make the hydroxyl radical? Sunlight. Would you have much sunlight in London in the winter? No. So how do you make sulfuric acid from sulfur dioxide in the winter? So basically, it was, it was a condensed phase reaction. So we don't know, because nobody was there doing the fancy measurements they can do nowadays, but you oxidise sulphur 4 to sulphur 6. Now we know this happens in cloud droplets, but there's an indication that it happens on the solid particles, the solid smoke particles, 
which had an oxidizing environment in, inside them by some catalytic condensed phase reaction. So the indication is that there was a lot of low pH particles that cause a lot of lung damage. And that lung damage led to the excess deaths. So it's actually a secondary pollution. Even though it's primary emissions that led to it, sulfuric acid is not a primary pollutant. It's not. Why is sulfuric acid not primary? <coughs> Does anyone know? Yeah, it's not a primary combustion emission. You don't get sulfuric acid as a direct release from the burning of coal. It's just the sulfur dioxide. So it must combine with the particles in some way. So we'll just move on to the, I mean, we've all, this is just a recap again. The next sort of smog was the photochemical secondary smogs. First recorded in Los Angeles in 1944. Requires not, VOCs, sunlight, etc. Can happen everywhere now. But I'm not interested so much in terms of the gas phase pollutants here. But what, if you look at the, the two pictures here, the top one and the bottom one, what's the difference between the two? One's got smog and one hasn't. But what is the difference? What, what, what do you see different between the two pictures? Optical depth. So what's that the optical depth of? Gases or particles? Particles. The primary particles or secondary particles? Secondary. How are the secondary particles made in a photochemical smog? So what are they? Are they inorganic or organic? Organic. Kind of a mixture, but mainly organic. So what we'll do is we'll detail some of the processes that lead to the secondary aerosol, secondary inorganic and secondary organic aerosol in a photochemical smog. And we'll lead on to the processes a bit later on in the course. Okay? But largely the secondary organic aerosols are coming from VOCs. So volatile organic compounds. So the NOx and the VOCs that form ozone as a secondary pollutant in photochemical smogs also form secondary particulates, so secondary inorganic and secondary organic aerosols uh, in the same smogs. Now here's an interesting picture. What do you think, where do you think this photo was taken from? So was it taken from an aircraft? Satellite? It was actually taken from the space shuttle. Okay? It was somewhere between. It wasn't in the high orbit, high satellite orbits. It wasn't taken from an aircraft. What's the interesting, or t tell me some interesting things. What do you find different about, or do you find anything surprising about that photograph? So, so why is the lake, so what's the lake doing? The lake's just it's basically reflecting sunlight. Okay? And the land around it, I think the sunlight, the zenith angle would be really low, and so it's coming off the lake. But you notice the layers of the smog and the cloud. So the smog, you can see, is darker. So it's absorbing. What sort of aerosol is that if it's absorbing? Black carbon. Black carbon. What other absorbing aerosol are there? Any idea what other aerosol might absorb? What aerosol particles? Sorry? Organic. Organic carbon. What sort of? Has anybody heard of brown carbon? Brown carbon is a special sort of organic material that has absorption at certain wavelengths. 
So it's not completely black. It doesn't absorb every wavelength. It absorbs some green light, some blue light, some red light, but not, it doesn't absorb evenly, and so can form brown carbon. Do you know where brown carbon comes from? It's secondary, largely, yeah? And a lot of them are nitrogen-containing organic compounds. So nitrogen-containing organic aerosol, quite often they absorb because of the electronic structure of the carbon-nitrogen bonds. So you can end up with an absorption feature. So that smog layer will absorb. So what will it do to incoming sunlight? Well, it will absorb it. What will it do to outgoing sunlight? It will absorb it. So what will it do to the atmosphere? It will warm it. Okay? The cloud layer above it, what will that do to the sunlight? Reflect it. What will the smog layer do to the clouds? Well, if it warms it, if you warm an air parcel at 90% humidity, what happens to that humidity? Yeah, the humidity drops. So the warming from the smog will lead to a reduction in the humidity and the evaporation of the clouds. So do you know about the direct effect of aerosols? What the direct radiative effect of aerosol is? Scattering and absorption. What's the indirect? Cloud droplets. What's the semi-direct effect? The semi-direct effect is the burning off of clouds because of absorbing aerosol. Okay? So you have three effects, and they're all quite complex. What would happen if the smog layer was above the clouds? Well, it would warm above the clouds, but the heat would rise, so it wouldn't burn off the clouds, because the clouds would be below them. But it would absorb any sunlight that was reflected upwards from the clouds. So you don't lose it, so it reduces the dimming effect of the clouds. It gets really, really hard to calculate the optical effects in the atmosphere. It is no good just to know how many particles there are and what they're made of. You must also know where they are in the atmosphere in terms of their layers, so their vertical distribution and their horizontal distribution. So this is one of the reasons that we're interested in aerosol particles, because of air quality and radiative forcing. Okay? So there are multiple optical effects there. Another reason that we're interested in aerosol particles, lung injury. So if you're on the beach and somebody kicks some sand in the air and you breathe it in, is that bad for your lungs? No, because you cough it up or you sneeze. It can't get to your lungs. If you have a mix of particles, so uh, you have some, I don't know, some, some flour in the kitchen when you're cooking, and you breathe in the flour, or you breathe in some ingredients, is that bad for your lungs? I don't know. Depends what's in the flour. I can't pick the flour. Been grinding the flour down. If your particles get smaller and smaller, they can become, they can get deeper and deeper into the lungs. If they're made of something that the, the tissue, the body doesn't like, the lungs try to get rid of them, but sometimes they can't if they've penetrated too deeply. If you smoke, is that bad for your lungs? 
No? Okay, so if there's a me but smoking has been claimed if you smoke one cigarette, it's supposed to be the same as breathing 648 micrograms per cubic meter of aerosol particles for one day. One cigarette is 648 micrograms per cubic meter. It's exactly the same loading. Or roughly, about that, about that loading. But is that true? What is the size of the particles that come from cigarettes? If you're very, very close to the tip of the, part of the cigarette and you breathe it in, you have a very, very high concentration. What happens to particles when you have a high concentration? They stick together. Yep. So if they're really, really high concentration, a lot of the particles can be very large. So when they are sucked into the lungs, they don't get down very deep, and they get brought up very quickly. <coughs> Only the finest particles get to the bottom of the lungs. So a lot of that 648 microgram per cubic meter equivalent is actually, when you breathe out from smoking a cigarette, you breathe out a lot of particles as well. Yep, they don't, they don't stick in the lungs. But the idea is that the smallest particles get deepest. And they can stick in the lungs and they can stay there for a long time. And if they're made of particularly nasty things, they can give you well, they can give you acute effects, but also long-term chronic health effects. And so, in addition to the radiative forcing and the optical properties, then the health properties are the other key driver. Now, have you done, have you done separate modules on health effects of pollution? It's a shame. Maybe I'll put a bit more of health effects in some of the other lectures. So you haven't done anything on health effects? Okay, well I haven't written anything in an exam about health effects. Should I include anything in the lecture about that? Are you interested in finding out about air pollution or being examined and passing the exam on air pollution? Well, you can come and ask me if you need any more information about things that aren't in the exam. What about the brain? What sort of particles will get to the brain? Uh, heavy metals. Heavy metals could get to the brain, but how might they get to the brain? Sorry? If they're dissolved in the blood, they can get to the brain. How do they get to the blood? They would need to go through a membrane. So they need to pass through a membrane. Unless you've got a wound. It needs to pass through a membrane. Now the way, the quickest way to get through a membrane in the body is through the nasal membrane at the top of the nose. And particles have actually been found in the brain if they are small enough to go through the nasal membrane. And so there have been a number of studies, and that one the last one I, I did a, a case study on was a Nature article in 2004 where very, very small particles were found in the brain that had passed through the nasal membrane. So if they are nanoparticles, they're on a few tens of nanometers, they're small enough to get through the membrane to the top of, top of the nose. So you've got health effects on the lungs, on the tissues. Have you heard about recent studies on psychological effects of air pollution? about how, there was a particular one in Beijing actually, the, um, a study that was looking at um, the incidence of depression and feeling ill because of just general psychological well-being decreasing and correlation to air pollution events. So there is not just 
There are psychological effects, there are physiological brain effects, there are physiological lung effects, and there are a lot of general um, debilitating effects of health. And it's a very active, uh, an active area. In fact, I am going to be doing a study on our smog chamber on psychological impacts of air pollution. And I will be getting volunteers to breathe diesel fumes from our smog chamber and then doing some tests before and afterwards. But I won't ask you guys, because I want you to pass your exams, yeah? <laughs> I don't want your cognitive faculties to be impaired because you need to pass your exams. But I'll let you come down and have a look and see some of the guys that are breathing, see whether, the, see whether it's making them more stupid. So that's short-term cognitive. Now there's limbs to Alzheimer's as well. So long-term cognitive decline, so not just short-term psychological effects. So aerosol, it's a public health issue as well as a climate issue. And one final reason, what does this sort of slide show? Well, basically, it shows the whole of the cycling through the biogeochemical environment. So aerosol particles play a role, as do gas emissions, on the nutrient cycling, macronutrient, micronutrient cycles, and pollution cycles right through the environment. Um, we've been doing you know, work about how things um, are deposited in the Himalayas and find their way down into Southeast Asia and these sorts of things because there's a lot of transport through the different pathways. But the air acts as a big vector. Aerosol particles in the air act as very effective vectors for transporting micro and micronutrients. So that's the final reason we're really interested in. So there's the climate effects, health effects and the biogeochemical cycle. But you do biogeochemical cycles with James Allen, did you? Yeah? Okay, good. So he's talking all about this. Yeah? Okay. He doesn't let me teach on this course. So I, I offer to teach him some organic chemistry for the, for the course. Do you, do you do much about the organic cycling in the carbon cycle? Organic atmospheric components? No. Okay. Have you, have, have, did you do this course last year or was it this year? Last year. Okay. Right. Let's move on to doing some of the detail about the global radiative balance. Are you familiar with the short wave and long wave radiative balances and the radiative budgets? So you don't want me to go through any of the things here. Are you quite comfortable that you understand the different places where aerosol particles can interact with the radiative budget? That essentially you've got the stratospheric and tropospheric absorptions. You've got the surface reflections, scattering, reflection by the cloud, the impact of albedo, when the albedo increases you get greater reflection, the direct input and the absorption by the surface from shortwave. And the long wave, um, all based around the energy that's released from the surface and how much of it is trapped by the atmosphere before it's lost into space. Trapped because of the absorption and scattering by both the clouds and directly from the aerosols. So these are the sorts of things that are at the basis of your understanding of the direct radiative effect. And don't forget, on top of the direct, you have the indirect and you've got the semi-direct effects. So, the direct effect and the indirect effect. The direct effect is at a particular time and particular location and the net direct effect is the integral across a period of time across all locations to come up with a global average of the direct effect. The indirect effect, is it more or less localised than the direct effect? 
Are clouds everywhere? Clouds are very heterogeneous. Are particles everywhere? You tend to get a more even distribution of particles and direct scattering than you do from clouds because clouds stop and then they start. If you look up in the cloud, uh, up in the sky on a cloudy day, you can either have stratiform cloud where it's continuous, or you can have discrete clouds. And the difference between the scattering from a discrete cloud and the clear sky is very, very great. It becomes very abrupt. And so that very abrupt change is many orders of magnitude bigger than the abrupt changes or the, than the changes from direct effects. Now obviously you can have plumes of aerosol particles, but those plumes can cause changes both to the direct... Well, here's an example. So, would a plume of part how does a plume of particles, or can you give an example of when a plume of particles can change the indirect effect? Do you understand my question? Okay, condensation tracks. And also ship tracks. Yeah? So basically the plumes of particles can it can influence both direct and indirect forcing because directly you can see them if you see smoke plumes, but indirectly you can see them if the supersaturation is high enough. But normally, when you don't have plumes, you have well mixed particle distributions, the direct effect is more even and homogeneous than the indirect effect, which is very localized where the clouds are. The albedo is a measure of the reflectivity of a surface or a body. So are clouds more or less reflective than the surface? What about if it's over the Arctic? Depends upon the underlying surface. If the underlying surface is dark, it can be less reflective, be more reflective, the underlying surface is bright, it can be less. So, is everybody familiar with this or something similar to this figure? This one, I think, was the 2007 report, but there's a 2013 report from the IPCC. Are you familiar with the different error bars? Do you understand what the, the different radiative forces are? The only thing to note here is the error bar associated with aerosols. So the total aerosol, the direct effect, and the cloud albedo effect. Is that someone for us? No? Okay. What does this tell you? What does, this, what does this bar here tell you? Okay, so the high uncertainty of the cloud, so the indirect effect. Yep. And this error bar, the high, fairly high uncertainty of the direct scattering. Now, both of these are negative. If the negative radiative forcing from the indirect effect, so the cloud adjustments, is as large and negative as this, it means it's almost as big as the certainty of the warming from carbon dioxide. So what does that actually mean? Does it mean that there is no such thing as global warming? If, if the aerosol particles are negative and large in their impact, and they are the opposite of the warming, does that mean there is no warming? No net warming? Why? Why? 
Yeah, you're on the right lines. So carbon dioxide and well mix. So carbon dioxide happens, the warming happens everywhere. The cloud forcing reduces the measurable effect of any warming at local places, but on average it will be enough if it is as large as the biggest, if it's large and negative as it could possibly be, it offsets it in different places by more than the carbon dioxide in some places, less than the carbon dioxide in other places, but on average it masks the effect of the carbon dioxide. But you could remove all of the aerosol particles from the air in about a week. That would be their lifetime, the tropospheric lifetime of aerosol particles. How long would it take you to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Yeah. Tens of years? Hundreds of years? Thousands of years? Of the order of tens to low hundreds of years because of the lifetime. So what you have is a very, very heterogeneous in time and space. A heterogeneous contribution to the dimming and the cooling, so the negative radiative forcing, and a very homogeneous, well-mixed, hemispheric mixing of the carbon dioxide. Um, even fully mixed, fully globally mixed carbon dioxide, nearly. And the methane is certainly hemispherically mixed. So it's a question of the time scales and the spatial scales of the mixing as to how the forcing becomes evident. They're not the same as each other. So this goes back to our my question. Are aerosols more or less well mixed than gases? Accumulation mode aerosol are in the red box. So somewhere of the order of weeks lifetime. The quickest, shortest lived gases are down at seconds to minutes. The longest lived gases with CFCs are globally very well mixed. So this is telling you that you can imagine that aerosol particles and tropospheric ozone are mixed to about the same sort of degree. But the aerosol particles are not just one chemical compound. All of those gases are single molecular species. Apart from CFCs, they're a class of chemical compounds. But the aerosol particles could be many do you think, how many different compounds are in aerosol particles? What order of magnitude? Is it one, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousand? Stop me when it's wrong. Hundred thousand, millions, ten millions, hundred millions. Quick, stop me. <laughs> there are some computer models that think there are up to ten to the eighteen compounds that could be present as secondary organic compounds in aerosol particles. I don't believe them because they're a model. Okay? But there are very, very many <coughs> tens, hundreds of thousands. If you, if you, are you familiar with uh, liquid chromatography or gas chromatography techniques? No? Okay. I think I've got one chromatogram later on, but if you just take the compounds that are formed in secondary organic aerosol from one VOC, so if you take toluene and you oxidise it with hydroxyl radical, there are more than 800 individual compounds in the aerosol particles. So how many VOCs are there? Thousands. And if you've got more than 800 oxidation products from one compound in the aerosol particles, You've got very, very many different compounds that can be in aerosol. So when we're talking about the lifetime and the temporal scale 
and the spatial scale of aerosol particles, we're talking about the lifetime and temporal and spatial scales of many, many millions of compounds. So all the gases are separated, but the aerosol particles here, they contain lots and lots of different compounds. So what's that red ball? It's dust. Okay? So this is aerosol optical thickness. What is aerosol optical thickness? What is it a measure of? Okay, backscattering coefficient. And if it's measured from a satellite, what does that tell you about the aerosol at that point in the red blob? The column, okay? It tells you how much aerosol there is along the line of sight of that pixel from the satellite image. So that doesn't tell you where it is, it tells you that it's in a column. Where do you think that is? Is that sea level? Is it higher up? Is it lower down? Is it troposphere? Is it stratosphere? Where do you think that dust is? It depends upon the circulation, but it's around the equator, so you have quite deep circulation. So it depends whether it's been entrained into a deep convective cell. But if you look, the yellow reaches South America, doesn't it? What's the lifetime of dust? Is it high or is it low? Why? It's heavy, it's big. Yeah? So when is the lifetime low? The lifetime is low when it's in the lower atmosphere. If the, life, if the, if the dust is lifted aloft, it takes longer to fall down. So its lifetime is longer. Because the lifetime is short at the surface, so if, if your dust is here, it will only take minutes to fall down. If your dust is 10 kilometers up, it will take many weeks to fall down. Yeah? If it reaches South America, do you think the dust is this far from the ground? No, it must be some distance up. So it is lifted from the Sahara and transported across to South America in that equatorial cell there. But some of it is deposited so it's not very, very high, but it's high enough for some of it to reach Africa. So what do you think the dust does when it gets to Africa? Uh, sorry, what, when it gets to South America? It's deposited. What does it do? It depends what it's made of. But it can add the nutrients. It can add African nutrients to the South American forests. So as well as optically forcing the climate by direct scattering, there is a, a component of the biogeochemical cycle where it's passing the minerals from the Sahara across to South America. So these are the sorts of things that are involved in the studies, in our aerosol science studies. So what's wrong with this picture? Can anyone see a discrepancy? Do we know what we're looking at? So the top is the mass fraction of sea salt and the mass fraction of sulfate 
in a marine environment. And the bottom is what the model says. And the model says there's lots more sulfate than sea salt. But the model makes the one critical assumption. Now what do we know about sea salt aerosol? Well, how, how sea salt aerosol formed? That's the wind. Okay? So if you blow on the surface of water, you get a spray. If you blow harder, you get more spray. Yep. If you blow really hard, you get waves. And the waves crash and they make more spray. So are sea salt particles big or small? Okay. Who thinks they're big? Who thinks they're small? They're big and small. Okay, so you're all right. Okay? But they're formed by three mechanisms. I'll talk about mechanisms afterwards. But the bubbles that are formed, the bubble cap breaks and forms fairly small particles. When the bubble cap breaks, there's a vacuum and it lifts some water from the middle and you get medium-sized particles. And when the waves crash, they form big particles. That model says that there are no sea salt in particles less than 4 microns. So the 91% of the sea salt in the top, which is the obse uh, observations, is because there, are, there is a lot of sea salt in the small size fraction. In the model, it's assumed that the small size fraction is all made of sulfate. So you can see that if you have a certain amount of ionic mass attributable to a certain compound, you can attribute a certain amount of the scattering. So when we make predictions and we make measurements of the scattering, <coughs> you need to know what the relative contribution of the different, uh, of the different components is. So these are the sorts of things that go into the retrievals of the data that was in the previous satellite picture because you need to know things about the refractive index and the mass of absorption coefficient, mass scattering coefficient in order to retrieve those, uh, retrieve aerosol loadings from the aerosol optical depth. So you can see here, that's just an example of the red blob. That's some Saharan dust being lofted. This is a, um, a true colour image rather than the False colour before. Okay. So, how familiar are you with the different sorts of radiation and the different forms of interaction of aerosol particles with light? Is this kind of new stuff? Kind of old stuff? It's kind of old stuff. We'll skip through it quite quickly then again. So, incident light. Your absorption increases the energy inside and you can get a re-radiation of different sorts of light at different wavelengths. You can get fluorescence. How does fluorescence work? Dependent upon the energy, the excitation wavelength, and the, the electronic transition that you need, then you can get fluorescence at a particular wavelength with a particular chromophore that leads to the fluorescence. Raman. How do you get Raman radiation? Raman scattering. It's again, it's just an interaction, it's a, it's a molecular level interaction. I won't go into the details, you don't need to know it. All you're going to need to know about is the me scattering from um, aerosol particles. And we'll detail the me scattering in a little bit. So you get bending, refraction, diffraction, when it doesn't actually heat, it's not an incident, but, uh, not incident on the particle. 
uh, and the thermal emission where you get um, emission of a wavelength of light, a, a long wave photon. So all of those components can lead to a mass extinction coefficient or a mass extinction efficiency and a single scattering albedo. Are you familiar with the, with, with the terminology up there? So the mass extinction coefficient or mass extinction efficiency is diameter dependent and dependent upon the refractive index. As is the single scattering albedo. What's the single scattering albedo? Is anyone there? The amount of scattering over the amount of extinction. Okay? So they depend upon the refractive index. So if something's more absorbing, it will have a lower single scattering albedo. If something's more scattering, it can have a single scattering albedo of essentially one. So you can see that diameter dependence and the refractive index dependence are the two terms there. So the mass extinction efficiency is dependent upon wavelength, dependent upon diameter of the particle, and the number of particles in the, uh, in the air mass. There's a density dependence, um, uh, sorry, a refractive, uh, density dependence, a refractive index dependence, and a diameter dependence. So all you need to know from this is that there's a component and size dependence of the mass extinction coefficient and the single scattering albedo. So if you were given this in, in an exam, do you think you'd need to remember the equations? Don't bother learning them. Okay? Not something to learn, but it is something to know what the different terms mean and how to use it. That's all you need to do. So if you've got any questions about what the mass extinction efficiency and the single scattering albedo are, Or is it self-explanatory self by the way? So would the mass extinction efficiency go up if you had a higher particle load? Would it? What's the definition? Extinction efficiency per unit total aerosol mass. So if you had a total aerosol mass went up, the total extinction would go up, but the extinction efficiency wouldn't. Okay? So remember that all you're doing is it's per, per unit mass. So you multiply it by the amount of mass to get the extinction. If the single scattering albedo went up, would you have more or less scattering? More. If your single scattering albedo went down, you'd have more absorption. Okay. Don't really need to know anything there, other than the decrease in visibility is the same thing that's responsible. Uh, so, the direct radiative forcing is is caused by the same thing that's responsible for the degradation of visibility. So, visibility reduction is another metric for something that could be used to indicate the amount of direct radiative forcing. So what makes clouds brighter? So are all clouds the same brightness? No. What makes clouds brighter? More More seeds. Yeah? Yeah? You're right. More seed particles. So what are they called? We learned this earlier on. More. Sorry. 
CCA, cloud condensation nuclei. Okay, condensation nuclei are particles. Cloud condensation nuclei are the aerosol particles that can act as seeds at ambient supersaturations. So if you have more cloud condensation nuclei, you get more droplets and you get a more reflective cloud. So, the second indirect effect. Are brighter clouds longer lived or are they shorter lived? So if you have the same amount of supersaturation and you have more particles, more droplets, are the droplets bigger or smaller? Smaller. If they're smaller, do the clouds live longer or shorter? Longer, because it takes longer for them to grow to big enough so that they fall out as rain. Okay? So brighter clouds can live for longer. So the first indirect effect is that the clouds are brighter and scatter more sunlight. The second indirect effect is that the clouds are there for longer. And so reflect more sunlight for a longer period of time. Okay? So more cloud seeds mean more droplets and longer lived clouds. And going back to the question, are clouds brighter or darker? If you've got an underlying surface that's like the ocean, or an underlying surface that's like sea ice or snow, and you put a cloud over the top, the snow becomes darker, or can become darker, and the ocean can become lighter. So it's exactly the same background, one becoming darker, the other becoming lighter. So the amount of indirect effect is not just dependent upon whether you have a brighter cloud, it's whether you have a brighter cloud that's over the top of a darker surface, then the indirect effect is increased. So it matters where your cloud is. So if you had aerosol particles that just went over the ocean, then they would have a good, strong indirect effect. If you had aerosol particles that went over the Arctic and formed a cloud, then they could have a warming effect. So it depends where it is, where your cloud is. What about really? Ah, okay. So this illustrates <coughs> smaller cloud particles, less precipitation, longer lived cloud. So more pollution. Does that mean pollution is good for you? Is pollution good? So if I was to write you an exam question to discuss the effect of pollution on clouds from the perspective of climate, is pollution a net warmer or cooler? From what we've just discussed about the indirect. The net cooler, because you can have more seeds that can make a brighter cloud, make a cloud live longer, and hence increase the scattering from both the first indirect effect and the second indirect effect. And so you've got a trade off between radiatively active gases and relatively active, but in the opposite sense, particles. Doesn't mean the pollution is good, it just means it has a different forcing effect. Okay? And the semi, well, apart from the semi direct effect, when you can have black carbon either in a cloud or below a cloud that can absorb radiation, that can warm it, that can evaporate the cloud, and then it will lead to a net warming. So whether pollution is a net warmer or cooler is dependent upon whether the particles are net absorbers or scatterers. So it depends upon their single scattering albedo. 
if there's a lot of black carbon in the pollution, then your single scattering albedo can be low, and you can increase the semi-direct effect, which burns off the cloud and reduces the indirect effect. Okay, we saw that from the space shuttle image, where you have a smog layer underneath cloud, except directly above the smog layer, you don't have cloud, you only have cloud where the smog layer isn't warm. But also, you can have the black carbon inside the cloud, such that when the incident somehow comes in, instead of being scattered, it gets absorbed, and you can absorb the light inside the cloud. So, your cloud can actually shrink. So if there was an essay question, an essay part of a question in your exam, do you think you understand what the potential impacts of pollution could be upon the indirect effect? I'm sure you do. We'll quantify that a bit later. So global dimming. I think an exercise that you could usefully... Do you all understand the term global dimming? Well, you could usefully look up to find out what global dimming is, what the phrase was used for. Because global dimming was a bit of a, a bit of a discussion that was had about how the negative radiative forcing from aerosol particles offset the warming from radiatively active gases or could be evidence for masking the observed warming that's seen in the atmosphere. So it could actually be that global warming is greater than we're actually able to detect. So there's quite a strong debate about how to interpret global dimming. Go and have a look and see if you can come up with some of the arguments about global dimming before next week or before two weeks' time. <clears throat> so, the answer is why. So you can tell me in a couple of weeks' time. Now, this here is a 3D image constructed to depict the global pattern of clouds and aerosols from multiple products from satellites. And it's really here just to illustrate the different spatial and consequently temporal scales of the warming and cooling that you might have. These, that's the direct effect, is the colour scale. The clouds are near true colour uh, images, but show the heterogeneity of the potential indirect effect that's superimposed upon the direct effect. Now, what I want to do, just over the next, I don't want to keep you here for too long and swamp you with too much information. What I want to do is ask you if you have any particular questions that you're going to want me to recap on and build on in the next lecture or so. Are you quite comfortable that you actually, you've already been introduced to all of the topics that we've been through today, to some degree. Are there any that are completely new? Are there any that are particularly difficult that you've previously had particular problems with understanding? So that I can re-emphasise what it is. I don't want to. I don't want to concentrate and focus on stuff that you really know well. What I want to do. Is focus on the stuff that you didn't understand the first time around, or think that you want more explanation about. So just let me know. I mean, it's this interactive thing, yeah. Otherwise, I could just give you my slides, and I could maybe not show up. It'd be really easy just to give you my slides. If you want me to actually help you with things that you don't understand, just try and throw me some ideas about what it is that you want some more help. I'm really happy to modify the course material to focus on the right things for you guys. <clears throat>
Man, ja. So that's going on from pools. Yeah. yeah. So there will be almost no meteorology yeah. in this course from here. So I will not touch any meteorology. But you're right, some of you will have a much better background and will have much more appreciation of radiation impacts on meteorology and on climate than the others. I won't really touch on anything that impacts on meteorology and you won't be tested in the exams on anything that's to do with meteorology or climate and energy or biogeochemical cycles. Okay? But what I will focus on are the things that might influence meteorology or climate or biogeochemical cycles. But I won't, I won't actually drill into those. I'll just talk about the things that are in the atmosphere. So in the gas weeks and the chemistry weeks, I'll talk about just gases and chemistry. In the aerosol week, I'll just talk about aerosols and clouds. Okay. So if there are anything in particular from the topics that we've just introduced today that you are going to that you found particularly difficult previously, just let me know. Don't have to let me know now. Just email me and tell me if there's a problem. Yep. Either a problem or something that's so boring that you know so well that I don't need to say any more words on it. Okay? Just remember, I know what's in the exam, and you don't. So I will make sure that I cover the exams here. Okay? Other than that, it's down to you guys to tell me what you're going to want to find most interesting and need most. Now, do you want me to carry on with the next lecture, or do you want me to let you digest this and come back with any questions about it in two weeks' time? I don't mind. You could have your money's worth or I could, I could just blow up your brains and give you another load of slides. Are you happy with this? Are you happy to digest what you've got so far? Go and find out a little bit about global dimming and come back next week. Yeah? Good. Excellent. Cheers. See you next week. Who's got the uh, scanner? Does anybody have the scanner or did you? One thing I forgot to mention, you will be able to get the podcast from this lecture, but not last week's. Um, because it wasn't activated, because I was in the wrong room. Now, these lectures will all be here uh, until, I think, the final two weeks of the semester. Uh, so if you look at your timetable, the room will change back to A112. Okay? And the podcast will be able always be activated if we're in the right room. I got the wrong instructions last week.
that one EPM equals to 122 times minus one gram Minus, minus nine. nine, roughly ten to the minus nine gram per cc. That's a nanogram per cc or per meter cube per cc. Uh, one gram. So that's one. So are you talking about ppm by mass or ppm by volume? One kilogram is roughly a cubic metre for a millionth of a kilogram, so for a microgram, it's a minus nine. Must be about correct because must be, I'll, I'll do the calculation exactly, but it must be about correct because of the, uh, the relative density of a solid and a, a gas. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. So I don't know the volume of that. But it must be about correct. I'll do the calculation. But, but could you understand the difficulty with now trying to represent something as a mixing ratio? So if you, if you now do the calculation as a volume. Uh, yeah, but you'd need the volume and the size, wouldn't you? But, uh, because if the particles are 100 nanometers or the particles are 1,000 nanometers, yeah. so, what's the so you wouldn't know whether you are talking part per million. So if, if the size, of, if the particles are smaller, then the volume, the volumetric mixing ratio will be different than if the particles were larger. No, I don't. But you're talking about the volume of the particles, which are not an ideal gas. Yeah, but simply assume it to be an ideal gas. But no, you can, afford, you can assume a gas is an ideal gas, but you can't assume a particle is an ideal gas because it's, it deviates too much from ideality. That, I believe the volume of our chameleon volume mixing ratio can be just the other, uh, other term as the number of mixing ratio. Then it makes sense. No, I don't think. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Normally, a volumetric mixing ratio is a. A mixing ratio is a volume divided by volume. Yeah. Yep. So. To why, not, why not number divided by number? Or, or number divided by number, yeah. but then, but then what, what do you, so what's the number of molecules in the particle? Yeah, that's easy. Uh, like Depends on the density of the particle, what the particle is. No, but that's not, the, that's not the number of molecules in a particle, is it? That'd be the number of molecules in an equivalent ideal gas volume of a particle. But if the particle, the particle is 100 nanometers in size, but you can imagine that the volume of an ideal gas, uh, well, you know, you know that one mole uh, is 22.4 liters uh, STP, but one mole of molecules um, can be um, a million times less in a solid, can't it? Because it's not, it's not an ideal gas. Condensed matter is much, much more dense. So the volume. No, no, but the number, number here is not the number of molecules inside the particle, but the number of particles. Inside the, the molecules, inside the, the number of molecules of gas. Yeah. Well, why is. I don't think that's a sense of. Mm, what? No, the point here is in a given volume, yeah. let's count the number of particles, yeah. and then count the number of gas. Yeah, but that's not that's not a volume, that's not a number mixing ratio. It makes totally sense. No, because you're you're not then providing a concentration 
Um, you're not providing all of the information you need. But I can calculate the number of concentration formulas as long as I have pressure. You could, but that is number per unit volume is not a mixing ratio, though, is it? Number per unit volume is a, is a number of concentration. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. All I was saying is that it's difficult to actually express it in terms of a mixing ratio because they need to be the equivalent metrics. The number of particles isn't the same as an equivalent, isn't the equivalent metric for a number of molecules. It's, it's just a, I, I, think, I, think, I think it's purely a, it's purely a definition thing. Now, I, I'm with you and I understand what you're saying. Um, I think that the normal way that mixing ratio is defined is a unitless quantity. Whereas number per volume has units of, of volume to the minus three. Uh, sorry, of length to the minus three. So it's, a, but a, it, it's just the units that I'm really concerned about. What you don't want to do is confuse units. So if you get given something in units of um, length to the minus three, so meters to the, per meter cubed or per centimeter cubed, then you... Uh, or if you were given something in mixing ratio, volumetric mixing ratio, which would be meters cubed per meters cubed, then you'd end up with the wrong answer. That's all. Um, that, that, that's, that's all it is. It's, 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 it's just pedantic. But you, you, you're dead right. But because I pair a lot with the uh, method which you all interpret in PDM and stuff. Yeah. 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 Which data? The method data. You probably know that. So. Yeah. Methane. Yeah. 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 It's, it's BAS, BAS project. In the BAS project, yeah. yeah. So this is with Grant Allen, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, methane data, you can always, you can always um, express any gas in terms of um, mixing ratios because you can make the assumption of an idea of gas and then all, all gases tend to be measured in mixing ratios or, or at least reported in mixing ratios. But uh, okay, so you're doing the work. You're doing work. What are you doing? Just some meta analyses of the bus project, or yeah, calibration, some simulation like that, to see if uh, to quantify the flux. Okay, so which instruments are you using? GTA, Caro, Amiga, Broken. Okay. So which which data are you using from from the aircraft? Or? Yeah, from the aircraft. Oh, it's good. It's grand students with work at the moment. So, uh, it's interesting. Which project is it? Which? It's in Uganda. Oh, the one in Uganda? Yeah. You're working on that, are you? No, I'm not working on that. But I'm sorry, on the North Sea. Right, okay. So the oil field stuff. Yeah, so. Yeah. Ah, good. Good. No, that's all good fun. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. I'll do that calculation. You're, you're probably very close, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't use it. Okay, cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you.